Hi, I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics and Fantastic Four Grand Design, and welcome to part two of this tour of Superpowers, the comic series I did for DC's Young Animal imprint. This would have been another, another comic, uh, another issue, but it, it sort of, you know, flows one into the other, and we have Iron Aaron. I'm allowed to use Z-list characters. How do I find a Z-list character who I care about? And, uh, you know, look at the Z-list characters within Kirby's body of work. So he had this character called Aaron, a proto-machine man. He was, he was a, a living uh, robot uh, raised by the scientist who created him. He was part of, uh, you know, fittingly enough, part of one of Kirby's backup stories that ran uh, in the back of Jimmy Olsen, uh, Tales of the DNA Project. So he created this robot um, who, who he loved like a son and who loved him, and he sent him off into space, and in his backpack was Superman's DNA, that the DNA project had cracked the code of Superman's DNA, and they didn't want the bad guys getting, getting a hold of it, so they sent him into space to just keep going and going with this so nobody could get their hands on it. And he gets attacked by, uh, you know, Exor's version of Parademons, and uh, um, they're sort of sky cavalry. Um, the Sphinx is consolidating his own power uh, on Exor, uh, sort of, you know, treating the, the king and queen, um, Jan and Zena's parents as, as sort of, you know, puppets and, and, and coming up with uh, an Exorian executive order to sort of, um, you know, co codify his own power at their expense. The Wonder Twins are in their sort of, you know, lavish uh, uh, room, uh, and Jaina is painting a sort of superhero suit version of of uh, Zan and herself, uh, the sort of superhero suits that that they will wear in in the uh, in the Super Friends cartoon, uh, you know, because they are superhero fans and, they, and they're coming up with sort of superhero cosplay for themselves, superhero personas, and so the uh, the sort of um, Exorian Parademons, which you know I call them something else, um, they they pry this backpack. And we see the top secret contents of Aaron's backpack. So I thought, um, you know, in the Kirby story, they refer to the backpack containing Superman's DNA. And I thought, well, that could be many forms. It could be, you know, just sort of, you know, a computer file that, that says, you know, what each piece of, of you know, Superman's, uh, you know, double helix says. Or, um, you know, it could be any, it could be, a, you know, a droplet of Superman's blood. Um, it could be one of his cells. But I thought... What if Superman's DNA is the uh, slaughtered carcass of Superman? What if it? What if it's Superman's dead body, uh, disassembled in in the same way that the uh, build a friend is in in Jack Kirby's OMAC? And so I have him placed in there. Now, of course, you know you, you see this and you're like, oh my god, it's uh, you know Superman's uh, slaughtered body in the backpack, but. Um, you know, and, and, and I kind of hope it registers as that and, and, and sort of gives you a little shock, gives the reader a little shock. But um, as the story unfolds, uh, you find out that there have been a number of experiments done with Superman's DNA. So that could be the original Superman all, all hacked up. Uh, and, and Aaron is, is unknowingly part of this cover up. Or it might be another Superman clone, you know, uh, sort of cut up. But but again, I'm trying to make a story that gets under your skin, that's that's intriguing, and a little bit creepy, and a little bit fun, and a little bit goofy. And now their powers are really starting to manifest themselves uh, in just very uncomfortable ways. Zan is like pouring down sweat. Uh, uh, Jaina is, is getting, uh, you know, her face is getting covered with a blue fuzz that's breaking out more and more. And she's just scared and ashamed. She runs off. Now she's starting to develop bird wings, claws, and then they, they, they touch fingertips and then they're back to normal. And again, that's, that's what trigger their, it triggers their transformation in the Super Friends TV series. They, they, um, put their fists together and they turn into an animal and a, and a, uh, and you know some form of water, and then you know they put their fists back together, and then they're normal again. So this is this is sort of them learning how, at least how to turn off their powers. At first, they don't know how to how to turn them on, but they know they're learning how to turn them off. And then there's a falling star, 
and you know just that sort of you know five pointed star is is a symbol in superpowers in the superpowers logo in the stargates that that you know substitute the boom tube that that they they use to move throughout um uh you know through throughout the universe uh um in the superpowers tv series and they see that the falling star is aaron so again these these plot threads that seem you know unrelated keep being drawn together uh you know like a big net now this right here um this might be this page is the sort of super superhero earth superhero segment of of this installment and this might be the the most popular the most you know uh shared page of comics that i've ever done i mean a, a lot of the transformers versus gi joe stuff uh you know circulates pretty heavily but but this might be be the biggest and it i i took advantage of this opportunity to do the origin of green arrow i kind of i was reading jack kirby's origin of green arrow and was sort of free associating with it and 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 uh, you know, came up with with what I thought was a really compelling story, and I was pushing the envelope a little bit. I was not a hundred percent sure if I was allowed to use Green Arrow or not, but I thought, let me just push the envelope a little bit, see what happens. The the worst they could do is is tell me no, and 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 I just have to come up with another page. No big deal. My job was to provide three pages of comics per month. Now I'm equipped to provide 20 pages of comics a month. So if uh if I'm if my job is 3 pages a month, then I'm going to put 20 pages worth of effort into those 3 pages. And and so redoing an, a, a one page isn't isn't going to break the bank. So um I did this story and and uh, Green Arrow ends up on a deserted island and I just like I took that Kirby origin and and tweaked it and pushed it and I incorporated other Kirby ideas like uh the Zine Arrow and and sort of gave it like a um, like a Miracle Man or Marvel Man twist, uh, and and I incorporated Starro that um, you know in the series um, Green Arrow ends up on Star Island, and so I thought, what if Star Island is Starro that and that Starro has sort of been you know part of Earth all this time and a whole island built up around him and it talks to to Green Arrow and 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 he's part of the Green he makes sort of like a Robin Hood outfit for himself and a bow and arrow. That's that's from the Kirby comics. Uh, out of, you know, he makes it out of the leaves and stuff. But I thought, let me just push that further and further. And and that he actually uh, smokes the the green, the leaves, and it's 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 a hallucinogen. And and part of what makes it hallucinogenic and allows him to talk to Starro is that the 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 sort of the the loamy soil that it grows in is is Starro. So so something of Starro's cosmic consciousness is being imbued, and and he uh, communes with Zine Arrow, who I redesigned here. I gave him you know very intense uh, magenta and purple colors. I gave him six eyes, made him extra alien, and he says, "I am Zine Arrow of Dimension Zero. Heed my words." String your bow to the vibration of the universe. Fight greed in all its forms. Use trick arrows. And so uh, when, you know, pirates come ashore, which again, I think the pirates are, are straight out of the Kirby story. Uh, he comes aboard and he fights them and he, and he declares himself, you can call me Zine Arrow. And then the, the news report talking about it mistakenly calls him Green Arrow, but the name sticks and, and that becomes his, his, uh, his, you know, nom de guerre, just using green, the idea of greed being green and money being green and, and, you know, the green leaf that's being smoked, just, just, you know, find ways to just give these things like a strong thematic underpinning. Did you ever wonder how Green Arrow came to be? This is the story that, that presented itself to me as, as I investigated. So right here, we're starting with the story of the angel. Yarva Angelicus Etrigan. Tom Scioli presents the Angel Etrigan. Gerard Way told me that when he was first putting together the lineup for Young Animal, uh, one of the things he wanted to do was he wanted to do uh, Jack Kirby's The Demon with me. And uh, it never got very far because, um, you know, they told him, you know, pretty much right off the bat that he wouldn't have access to The Demon. So that was scrapped. I, I hadn't heard about that until... Uh, you know, until I started working on superpowers and he told me about that. I was sort of working 
uh, you know, within the limitations of the characters I was allowed to use on superpowers, uh, one of the approaches was to do uh, DC prehistory. So uh, if I couldn't use the demon, maybe I could use the angel. Stories of Etrigan before he became a demon, before the fall, uh, when he was an angel. Now, uh, for the border, you know, I'm, I'm looking for different ways of telling a comic story, and, and these borders sort of, you know, harken back to, um, you know, like tapestries or architecture. It just kind of gives it this sort of, you know, ancient look. This would be a story that is, as it says up here, before the beginning. Um, so, you know, Earth is populated by these sort of um, eidolons, the pre-human creatures, and you have these other pre-human creatures, the angels, and one of them is is Etrigan, and one of them is Phantom Stranger. Alan Moore had done a Phantom Stranger story where it was the story of the Phantom Stranger who, uh, you know, according to Alan Moore, was an angel, and it's before the Great Rebellion of, of uh, angels who you know, became demons. And so among them was Etrigan. And, 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 you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, leave it to Alan Moore. It's like, yeah, that's a really, you know, sort of obvious thing that nobody else had ever thought of that. Yes, um, if Etrigan was a demon, then, uh, you know, he must have started out as an angel at some point, since uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the cosmology is that all demons are former angels. So this is something that kind of fascinates me about the DC universe. The DC universe has a lot of biblical things and, and you know, religious figures. There's, uh, you know, Solomon in the Shazam pantheon and, you know, various angels and demons. And, and those, those kind of stories always uh, intrigue me because you, you have sort of the fully 100% imaginary characters like Superman and Batman, but then you have these sort of quasi-imaginary or quasi-real characters that they share space with. Um, and, and what I mean by quasi-real or quasi-imaginary is that they are characters that, um, you know, a certain percentage of the readership uh, regards them as, as real things, these sort of supernatural creatures they, they regard as real. That's a, that's a very interesting to play with as, as a creator when... Uh, you know, how much more interesting w would a Superman story be if, uh, you know, your readers actually believed Superman was was real? And so it's the same there. It's kind of, um, you know, s some readers will read this and it's just sort of an imaginary fantasy story and others would read it and say, oh, yeah, there, you know, there is a heaven and there there are angels and there are demons and there was once a war between angels and demons. So it's just sort of a fun thing to play with. The Red Hand, the Unifriend from the New Gods, uh, which, you know, according to this story I'm making, uh, actually goes back, you know, to the beginning of time and uh, writes out uh, a message in fire, um, in holy fire, war in heaven, return to the silver city. Now, the silver city, I'm assuming that's some sort of classical thing, uh, you know, that's, that's maybe found in mystical texts, maybe found in the Bible, you know, but I mean, everything I ever learned, I learned from comic books. And so the Silver City is, you know, featured in like Grant Morrison's Justice League. It's where Zumiel, I think his name was, uh, Zumiel, the angel who was briefly a member of the Justice League. It's where he came from. So it's basically, you know, the DC Comics name for heaven. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't doubt if Alan Moore used it. Alan, in fact, Alan Moore probably did use it in that Phantom Stranger story that I'm kind of referencing a little bit here. So in that Phantom Stranger story, angels that rebel, and the Phantom Stranger can't decide which side to be on, uh, whether to join the, the rebellious angels or with the, uh, you know, the, the other angels. And so he gets, he becomes a, a man apart. He sort of, uh, you know, no side wants him since he couldn't decide. And, and so he sort of you know, uh, wanders the earth forever, uh, you know, sort of a man without a home. I redesigned Etrigan the Angel a, a bit. I, um, you know, the the design that was in the Alan Moore story, uh, who, uh, you know, forgive me, I, I don't recall who drew it. I'm thinking maybe it was Al Williamson uh, that did the art. But uh, the design for Etrigan, it was interesting, but he was a little too animal-like and... Uh, you know, not, not quite what I wanted uh, him to be. I thought I want to make him look like 
he could sort of devolve and become uh, the demon Etrigan that we all know. But uh, I wanted to sort of make him sort of idealized, beautiful, uh, you know, maybe a little more silver surfery, you know, kind of this like idealized form. Now, since the demon is sort of like this husky, squat kind of character, I thought, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't just make him this, uh, you know, sort of lithe, uh, you know, ballet dancer or something. I, I had to make him still kind of chunky, but, 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 you know, sort of tall and, and, uh, you know, more, um, you know, idealized. And, and, uh, so that, this is the design I came up with and I gave him a shield with, you know, a, a letter E on it. And I, I kept some of his design elements, like the, the bands on his, uh, uh, just below his shoulders. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of this angel design that I came up with. And I feel like, uh, you know, um, Jack Kirby's The Angel Etrigan, uh, by way of Tom Scholey, could, could, you know, be its own series. It's not the rebellion yet. This is before that. This is an attack from a Lovecraftian, you know, elder god kind of character, a competing, a, a competing pantheon of sort of you know, dark Lovecraftian gods. And, and I use the name Ipsissimus uh, uh, to describe this sort of creature that he fights, Ipsissimus. And again, Ipsissimus, I'm sure it's like a thing that like, you know, maybe Aleister Crowley talked about or maybe was in, you know, some kind of, you know, Babylonian text or, or some kind of Sumerian text or something. But uh, me, I, I, you know, learned the name from comic books. I learned it from Alan Moore Comics, uh, Ipsissimus and and uh, the Ipsissimus is kind of this like this like super wizard who has uh, who's more powerful than God, um, you know, and has the power to dethrone God. So um, you know, I sort of I, I thought it was a cool name, a cool concept. So I applied it to sort of these uh, Lovecraftian uh, dark gods, and so you know we get some some cool action. Uh, uh, here's uh, the angel striking the pose that that the demon has on the on the cover of the demon number one. He fights Ipsissimus. Ipsissimus, you know, draws him inside himself and tries to tempt him. You know, tells him that he could join join the Ipsissimus and 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 be more powerful. And 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 uh, and he says, no, I serve only him uh, and and no others. Uh, and the him is. Uh, is God. In in my original script, I had him referred to as, I, I had, you know, God referred to as like Yahweh or Jehovah or, or, or you know, one of those, uh, you know, names for God. And, uh, you know, editorial said, no, you know, we, we can't do that. And, and they suggested, you know, calling him the presence, which is kind of like DC's official name when they have sort of, you know, God, you know, God with a capital G uh, in a story, they call him the presence, which I think, I think that was in like, like some Jim Starlin stories or something, but I, and I know that like the presence it's got, you know, it's, it's like a reference to like, I don't know, the Bible or, or something or paradise lost, or, you know, I, I know that, that the name presence has its bona fides. It's, it's, you know, a legitimate term, but I don't know. It just sounded, too, it sounded dumb to me. It sounded phony, hokey. It sounded, it just made me think of like the Led Zeppelin album. So I, I didn't want to use that. So what I did was, uh, just whenever he's referred to as, you know, he or him or me or I, I made uh, the, drew the lettering for those words uh, in like a super fancy kind of like script that you would see in, uh, you know, like a gothic script, I guess it's called, you know, some kind of like, uh, you know, illuminated manuscript kind of, kind of writing. Um, and that sort of did the trick for me. So uh, thanks to uh, the angel Etrigan, Yarva Angelicus Etrigan, the, the invaders of the Silver City are, are banished and defeated. And, and then we sort of get a hint of trouble to come, that, that we've established that Etrigan serves none but, but him. And so now, uh, you know, uh, God, uh, you know, Yahweh, Jehovah, is um, uh, the presence, is telling him about this new creation in, this, in his garden, this new creation called man. And he says, I want you to serve, uh, to serve man as you would serve me. Now, you know, my dad would tell me stories about, you know, heaven and hell and, and angels and demons when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, and one of the things I remember him saying was like, uh, you know, the only person we know for sure that's in hell is Satan. You know, hell could be empty for all we know. You know Lucifer, or Satan, you know, whoever, the, the rebellious angel might be the only one in there or whatever. Uh, and then like another story he would tell me 
would be how, you know, one of the stories was that uh, the reason uh, Lucifer turned against God was because God asked him to to, you know, serve mankind and and he refused because he he loved God so much he only wanted to serve God and stuff. So I'm sort of I'm riffing off of that. And I, I think I think that's like part of Joseph Campbell too. I think I think he talked about that story too. Might might be where my dad got it from. I don't know. If you're, you know, tuned into these kind of things and and sort of following the flow of the story, maybe when uh, you know, Etrican's think thinking about, you know, what what God's telling him and sort of the conflict that he has over it. You think, okay, maybe this is the beginning of of the uh, the rev- the revolution, but but he says, you know, thy will be done, and that that's the end of this story, and so sort of okay, everything's okay, but you know, we we know you, you know we know the angel's gonna gonna change sides at some point, so you know maybe this is uh, you know the beginning of the end, so so that's that's that that's the story of the angel. Uh, and Yarva and Angelicus Etrigan, I took Kirby's thing of Yarva Demonicus Etrigan and just, you know, changed the Demonicus to Angelicus. Um, w- the continuing of the Wonder Twins story, their, uh, their cousin, who's sort of like a, a little Lord Fauntleroy kind of character, he's telling them about how, how their father, you know, has dungeons and, and this is news to them. They're kind of, you know, kind of uh, shocked, surprised, and bummed out by the idea that, that the castle that they've been living in all their lives uh, has a dungeon where they, where they keep prisoners. And so they go down and they meet Iron Aaron, who uh, you know we met in, in the previous issue, and, and those uh, quasi-parademons uh, you know, kind of ha- have him imprisoned. And so they're, they're going to bust him out, and they're going to tell their father about it because they think maybe, maybe, maybe father and mother just don't know about this place. So... Uh, you know, and we're going to tell your story because you're sort of, you know, falsely imprisoned. And then there's his backpack. He takes his backpack. It's obviously been uh, confiscated. And, um, uh, you know, your uh, your valise has been salvaged. The contents were disintegrated, of course. So he's got his backpack, and, and we know what was in the backpack. Uh, Superman slaughtered corpse. Uh, but, you know, the contents were disintegrated or, or, or so, uh, you know, this sort of... Uh, you know, uh, prison warden or whoever is telling them. But then in the, in this last panel, we see that, um, that actually the contents were, were taken by the Sphinx and he's having his, uh, you know, geneticists use the, the sample of Superman to, 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 you know, do sort of experiments and, and, you know, create their own Superman. And so far, uh, none of their creations have survived, but, um, if you have this sort of, you know, evil, you know, uh, Sphinx kind of character, what they were afraid of has happened, and, and now he's got possession of, uh, you know, a bad guy has possession of Superman's DNA. Uh, we're looking at some trouble. If this guy can, you know, create an army of supermen or super monsters, that's big trouble for the universe. And so now I'm trying to, uh, you know, and now I have one more, uh, you know, superhero page that's not the Wonder Twins. And, and I wanted to sort of go back to that continue that Batgirl story. So I sort of had this idea of what if Wonder Woman's lasso is kind of like, uh, kind of has like a life of its own and it's it's kind of almost like a snake and we call it Lassie. Batgirl, you know, tries to talk to it the way like a character would talk to the dog Lassie uh, and, and sort of like, what girl, what? what? You, um, Wonder Woman's in trouble? What, you know, tell, tell me more, tell me more. You know, sort of try to guess what uh, the lasso uh, Lassie is trying to tell her. So she's asking and then um, and then, you know, she tries to like, touch Lassie and then Lassie kind of like whoosh, kind of like you know whips her hand she's like okay okay and she's asking Lassie a bunch of questions she is can you take me to her and she's nodding her head and leads her to the invisible jet now we can see the invisible jet that's one of the conventions of comics we can see the invisible jet I draw the invisible jet but she can't see it so now we see you know she's sort of pressing her her face and her hands up against the the uh, invisible jet and it's like, okay, that's it. And then she opens up an invisible door, climbs inside, and pulls out Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, can you hear me? Batman? You know, sort of mistaking, uh, you know, in her, her you know, semi-conscious state, mistaking Batgirl for Batman, which I sort of wanted to be sort of a, a running thing where, like, Batgirl shows up and for a second, you know, they see the silhouette and they're like, is that Batman? You know, or she shows up in the Batmobile or the Batwing or something. And it's like, Batman, no, it's me, it's Batgirl. And then this last part, it's the Green Lantern Corps and they've landed on Earth. Rejoice, humans, fear not. 
Earth belongs to Oa. The shit is really hitting the fan on Earth. Every, everybody's, you know, coming here. And I thought, you know, there's all these sort of, you know, monstrous aliens in the Green Lantern Corps. And I, I thought it would be interesting to sort of emphasize that, take some of those sort of monstrous looking aliens, emphasize their monstrousness, and, and you end up with a, a Green Lantern Corps that's kind of scary. That it's like, yeah, like, you know, who exactly are these guys who are sort of imposing their will on the rest of the universe? Uh, it seems a little sinister. So, so I wanted to sort of emphasize that here. And there's this kind of like robot member of the Green Lantern Corps. And so I, I gave him a little bit of like a, uh, an IG-88 makeover there. But just, just you know, taking, you know, these, these established characters and, and kind of like amping them up, uh, amping up the horror. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics and Fantastic Four Grand Design. And join me next time where I'll talk about the next six pages. I'll see you then.